if we've decided somewhere along the way that hope is a kind of optimism or like a positive state of mind, then we need to look again at what scripture really says about it. Peter says we have been doing a little bit of a a sort of a mini series over the past few weeks since Vision Sunday when Pete really laid out the vision for the year and we studied that passage in Numbers where the people of Israel finally come upon the land that they've been promised but at the final hurdle their fear overcomes them and all but two of the men say No way is God going to give us this land. It's filled with giants. It's too scary. Yes, it's incredible. Yes, it's filled with everything God has promised us. But we cannot see past the giants that stand between us and the promise. And Pete on Vision Sunday, he said, we want to be like the two, like Caleb and Joshua, who saw the promise and said by faith, we can surely do it. And so since then, we've been leaning a little deeper into that idea. How can we be a people who say, we can surely do it? What was it about Caleb and Joshua that caused them to react so differently to everyone else? And how can we, as followers of God in our culture today, how can we learn to stare down the giants in the land and walk with faith instead of fear into all that God has for us? And so I'm closing out this little mini-series for us today. And as I've been praying into this idea of staring down the giants in the land, the word that I just keep returning to is hope. The power of hope to anchor us in a foreign land filled with giants. And it reminds me of a time in my own life when I found myself suddenly alone in a foreign land filled not with giants, but with French people. Um, The year was 2004. I want to take you guys back there. 2004, I was 16 And I got the opportunity to work at a summer camp out in Paris. Now, 16-year-old Hannah had her her hopes and her visions and her dreams set on becoming an international journalist for the BBC. As you can tell, my career has gone exactly as I anticipated at that point. Um, But that was my plan at the time. And so I got this opportunity to work out in France, to work on my French skills. And I thought, this is a great CV thing. I'm going to grow in my French. And so I applied and I got this job working for six weeks of the summer. And these kids, they were French school kids who were going away for the summer and they were doing all kinds of fun activities. And for two hours a day, they had to practice their English. And so my job was to come along as an English language learning assistant and help them to practice their French. And so I applied for this job. I got the job and off I went. 16-year-old Hannah headed off to Paris And the plan was that the French headmistress of the school who was running the camp, a lady called Isabel, she would come and pick me up and take me there. Now, Charles de Gaulle apparently can be tricky to drive to. So she emailed me before I left and she said, so what you need to do is you go from the airport to the metro, take four stops this way, change here, then take three steps this way, and I will pick you up at that stop. Sounded simple enough. (laughs) for 16-year-old Hannah. So I fly to Paris, but the first problem occurred because I flew EasyJet. Um, And so, of course, I was delayed, and my flight landed really, really late. Um, But it's fine. I'm sure it'll be fine. So I land, I get down, I go into the metro, and I get on the appropriate train, and it's hurtling along, hurtling along. I see, you know, you can watch the stops, and it just flies straight through the one I'm supposed to get off at. So I'm like, panicked. What do I do? So I turn to the person next to me, and I'm like, qu'est-ce que c'est? Or, I don't know, I'm sure it was better. (laughs) I'm sure it was better French at that point. What is happening? Why didn't it stop? And they said, oh, after 11 11 p.m., the trains don't don't stop there. So (laughs) what, what do I do? So I stay on this train, and I'm panicking and panicking. And off it goes. And finally, after an eternity, it eventually stops somewhere. Goodness knows where. So I get out and I'm thinking, what, 
what am I going to do now? How am I going to get to this lady? And um, I'm in a foreign land where everyone's speaking a different language. And here's the thing, you guys. The iPhone, that did not come out until the year 2007. So what I had, my phone at this time was a very stylish, bright pink Nokia 8310 which was the classy girl's choice of the day. And very good if you want a little game of Snake 2 while you're waiting. (laughs) But absolutely useless if you find yourself in the middle of Paris with no international roaming plan. And of course, no internet. (laughs) I can't Google the subway plat. I can't can't call this woman. I can't call home. I can't, you know, call for an Uber. What do you do in the midst of a foreign land when you find yourself in a situation like this? I emerge out of the subway, goodness knows where. I scan the horizon to try and orient myself, and then I see it like a beacon of hope. I spot an enormous pair of Mickey Mouse ears, (laughs) like an oasis in the desert, right? Because Disney, that's the place where dreams come true. (laughs) And I... And I needed a symbol of hope, right? I needed something that said, it's okay, you don't have to just turn back and go back to the airport, you can keep going. Disney is there. I get myself into the Disney hotel. I speak to the nice person on reception. I borrow their phone. I make contact with the woman. Of course, she knows exactly where I am. And within an hour, I find myself at this camp. (laughs) A little shaken. But we got there. But what do we do when we find ourselves facing a foreign land and there's giants in the land? What are the symbols of hope as we scan the horizon? What are the things, what are the promises, what are the things of goodness that we're going to look for that are going to keep us moving forwards and not just get the next metro back? See, for Caleb and Joshua, they go into the promised land and they scan the horizon. And what do they see? They see giants, yes, but they also see fruit. And when I saw those Mickey ears, it wasn't just any old mouse ears, right? It's a symbol of something greater. They see this fruit and they see it and they know that that is the promise. The fruit is the symbol of hope that says, I am giving you this land. And so because they see the fruit, they can see past the giants, What are the symbols of hope? What are the things that we are going to be looking for as we scan the horizon? See, the difference between Caleb and Joshua and all the others is that something had gripped their hearts, which causes them to look at the exact same set of circumstances totally differently. Something had gripped their hearts, which doesn't mean that the giants were any smaller, but they see them differently. And I think the thing that gripped their hearts was hope. You feel it overflowing from them. Yes, there are giants, but there is fruit and we can see it and we can picture it. They're possessed by a hope that causes them to see things differently. Hope is the substance of their yes, but. Hope is the oxygen that fuels their courage. And hope is the force that propels them into the promised land. One preacher said, hope is the oxygen of heaven. And when we're facing down giants in our lives, we need to breathe differently, right? We need to breathe the hope of heaven and get courage into our hearts. So what is hope from a biblical perspective. I want to read together from Ephesians 1, if you've got your Bible there. If not, it's going to come up on screen. Ephesians 1, starting at verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and anointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. 
that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so you know hope. The hope that set Caleb and Joshua apart was this thing that enlightened their eyes. It allows them to see differently. And the hope that we have in the power of Christ, it enlightens our eyes and it causes us to see even the most challenging of circumstances differently. Or as Elizabeth Elliot put it, the secret is Christ in me, not me in a different set of circumstances. Biblical hope enlightens the eyes of our hearts. It transforms the way we see the things in front of us. Sometimes, though, I think the problem with hope, even as a concept, as a word, it can sound like this slightly cheesy, almost fridge magnet thing. You know, where like something you're going to crochet onto a pillow or something that you sort of vaguely say into the air, like, I hope it's going to be dry for wildfires. <laughs> like, hope can feel like this kind of wishful thinking, positive optimism. And I think it can feel vague and slippery at best, or cliched and sentimental at worst. But I'm really struck when I read this passage that hope in the Bible is something really different. Just look at the sheer weight of, of power that Paul is expressing here. Look at his language. Incomparably great power, mighty strength, fullness, authority, power and dominion. This hope is not elusive or cliched. It is hope with substance, hope with teeth. If we've decided somewhere along the way that hope is a kind of optimism or like a positive state of mind, then we need to look again at what scripture really says about it. You may be familiar with uh, this quote by the writer Emily Dickinson. She, she wrote this beautiful, very evocative description of hope where she says, hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul. Um, and it's really beautiful writing. And I, I hate to disagree with the wonderful Emily Dickinson because it is stunning. But I want to say this, the trouble you see with feathered things is that they tend to be easily startled and take flight. My son here in the front row, he's currently passed out, he loves nothing more than a feathered thing. Chicken, duck, a passing magpie, it just fills him with joy. He loves them and he immediately tries to get his little chubby hands on them. But feathered things take flight. They will not be grasped. They will not be held. They are flighty. They are elusive. And I don't know, maybe hope has felt a little bit like that for you. Like a feathered thing, something elusive and flighty, something hard to hold on to. But what the Bible has to say about hope is so different from this. In Hebrews 6, it says this, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. I want you to take a minute to picture an anchor. I think I have one up here um, for you to look at. Anchors are solid. They are heavy, weighty, and reliable. They are designed in such a way that you can bet your life on them. They are solid. An anchor with feathers would be an absurd idea. The two images are diametrically opposed. Biblical hope is not flighty. It is sturdy, stable, dependable, secure. Why? Because it is based on the character and the promises of God. It is completely secure. So when we journey through tough seasons and we feel beaten and battered by the waves, the Bible says hope. What it does, it's an anchor which hooks onto the bedrock of the ocean floor and it allows us to remain steadfast and secure and held despite our circumstances. When you're in pain or feeling fearful or lost or adrift, what is your anchor? What is the thing that you want to grab onto? What do you dig into to regain some sense of stability and peace? See, the Bible says if we make hope our anchor, we'll be steadfast and secure. This passage says, take hold of hope, choose it, grab onto it and hold on. But you know, the beautiful thing is that we don't just hold on to hope 
hope holds us. That's what an anchor does. It holds us. And so being people of hope is not like trying to grasp onto a bird in flight. It is dropping anchor and resting, knowing that we are held. A few years ago, Adam and I were lucky enough to go on a holiday to Disneyland, just to bring this talk full circle back to the Mickey ears. And we went on this amazing holiday to Disneyland with his whole family. And I had never been on a roller coaster before this holiday. And day one, we arrive at the park. Now, I'm used to like Barry's style little fairgrounds. That's, that was my experience. And we walk into, we started at Universal Studios. And we walk in, and the first ride that we come to is the Hulk roller coaster. I think we have a picture of it. We've never seen it. So that's it. Um, we walk into the park. That's the first one we arrive at. And all the Heather boys are like, oh, there's no key for that. Let's go. And you have this moment, don't you, where you're like, we were just dating at the time. I don't think we were even, were we engaged? We were engaged, sorry. We were <laughs> But you're still trying to prove yourself, right? And so they're all like, right, let's go, let's go. And in this split second, I knew it. I was like, this is my choice. I can be in or I can hold the bags. And, um, and I thought, I'm in. I'm just going to go. So, I, so before I knew it, I'm just like sitting at the base of this roller coaster, just rethinking all of my life choices that had led me to this moment. <laughs> and right before you get shot off into this loop the loop thing, there's this moment where you have to pull down the seatbelt. So you pull it down, and then they come round and they secure it. And, um, and then off you go, um, praying that this will all be OK. And as you're going, there's these little, there's these little handles like on the seatbelt. I think there's another picture that shows you those. So you see those, there's those little handles, right? So you're going round, and you're gripping it for dear life like as you go around and around this crazy course. And, do you know, I think, I think there's something in this uh, that is a little bit like hope. Because you have to activate hope, right? You sit down in the roller coaster, you pull down in the seat, but you have to activate it. You choose it, you pull it down. But then there's this moment where you're being held by it. And yes, you hold on, but the reality is you're being held. Okay, as I go round that roller coaster, it's not my little hands <laughs> keeping me in the seat. It's the seat belt. And if I, if I did have the courage to let go, I would discover that I am, in fact, held. And I think there's something about biblical hope that is like that, that says, yes, choose hope, activate it, take hold of the promises of God. But then when you find yourself upside down, know that you are held. Hope holds us. Sometimes I think God, he wants to come along and just loosen our grip a little bit. Like, I know you're tired. I know that you are holding on so tight. But don't worry. I've got you. You are held. You're not holding this whole thing together. You are held. Being a person of hope is dropping anchor in the promises of God and letting them hold us. So what are some of the enemies of hope in our lives? Because the Bible says Jesus comes to give us life in all its fullness, but the enemy, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So what are the enemies of this hope? Increasingly, I am convinced that the biggest threat to our hope is actually simply anything which we grasp as an anchor instead of God. I think it's when we go through the storms of life and we know we need to grasp something, but if we're honest, we grasp the wrong thing, right? We maybe try and root ourselves, try and anchor ourselves in material things instead of earthly things. What are your anchors? What are the things that you reach for? The book of Psalms suggests three anchors that people are often tempted to grasp. These are power, people, and possessions. And if you go through Psalms, it'll say, don't put your hope in this. Don't put your hope in this. Don't put your hope in this. Now, none of these things, they are not problematic in their own right. However, they make terrible anchors for the soul. 
We were made for so much more. The human soul was designed to hope in God. Nothing else is going to hold us. Or as Charles Spurgeon once said, the more objects you set your heart upon, the more thorns there are to tear your peace of mind to shreds. Material wealth is a really interesting one in particular because it feels solid. Like gold is a weighty thing. It feels dependable. It feels like it would hold you. And yet, look at what the Bible says. Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone. For they will surely sprout wings and fly off. Do you see it? The thing with feathers is not hope, after all. It's actually those weighty-looking gold bars. Wealth is the feathered thing which will fly away when you try and grasp it too hard. Hope is the weighty anchor that you can depend on. So pick the right anchor. Hold on to hope and let it hold you. And then hold on together. The Bible doesn't spell out too much detail about the dynamics between Joshua and Caleb as they go on this mission into the promised land. But it is interesting to note, isn't it, that it wasn't one but two of them that said, we can surely do this. And it just makes me wonder, was there a shared hope? Did they pray together? Did they talk together? Did they encourage one another's hope? See, it's important that we have spiritual disciplines at work in our lives. All the stuff that Peter shared, which was so beautiful about getting the scripture inside of us. Adam's message about the word and the works and the wonder of God. All these disciplines help to sustain us. But it's really important that we don't try and stare down giants alone. One of the things I love about scripture is it is radically, unapologetically, crystal clear about the importance of relationships and community. And you know, we live in a culture that prides itself on independence and it's made us increasingly isolated, but the voice of the Bible is so clear. You're designed to do this together. You're not meant to take on giants on your own. So be careful and choose who you're going to surround yourself with. Caleb and Joshua, they both held on to hope. But what's interesting is the rest of the men didn't have that hope. They had their anchors somewhere else. And the Bible says this, they spread a bad report. And that night, all the people of the community raised their voices. Hopelessness became gossip that spread like wildfire and turned the hearts of the whole community See, where there isn't strong hope, there's also probably fear. And I am becoming increasingly convinced that what fear does is it just opens a back door somewhere for cynicism. And cynicism is such a destroyer of hope. Cynicism can sound like sensibleness, but it's just fear in disguise. And the problem with cynicism is it loves company and it spreads like wildfire. Have you ever noticed how the arrival of one cynical person into a room can change the atmosphere just like that? All the people raise their voices, just spreads. Cynicism is really loud. And if we want to be a people of hope, our hope needs to be louder. It needs to be more contagious than cynicism. We need to speak a better word. And so we need to surround ourselves by people who are going to be voices of hope in our lives, voices of encouragement. What, what, what do you want speaking the most loudly into your life? Like, do you want the cynical voices to shape you or the hope-filled ones? And I love when you read through scripture, we don't have time to go into them, but there's so many of these moments and these friendships where, where people stand and they hold on to hope together. Like that gorgeous moment with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the angel comes and says, you're going to have the son of God. And she is just like, what is happening? But in faith, she says, yes, I will do as you've said. Her reaction is extraordinary, but what she does next is so beautifully ordinary. It says she hurries to the hill country to go and see Elizabeth. Like she gets with another person, a person of hope. And Elizabeth then says, blessed is she who believes the word God has spoken to her. Right? She knows where to go to find the voice of hope. Imagine if she'd find someone cynical. She surrounds herself. And then there's this other really cool moment. It's just a tiny little moment in scripture. Um, and it happens in, uh, where does it happen? 
Somewhere in numbers. Somewhere in numbers. Um, Jonathan. Um, they, they wanna, there's this whole military thing going on, which we don't have time to go into. But Jonathan has this vision. He's like, I think God's going to give us this, these people. And so he says to his armor bearer, literally what he says is, I think perhaps the Lord might give us them. <laughs> it's like this very vague kind of, I think maybe we could do this, just the two of us. Like, we don't even need to tell Saul. I think we could do this. And, uh, and his armor bearer, just amazingly, is like, he says this, do all that you have in mind. Go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. Isn't that a beautiful little verse? Do you have friends who grow your hope? They are with you, heart and soul, because we cannot stare down giants together. We've got to do this. Um, sorry, we cannot stare down giants alone. We've got to do it together. So coming in to land, what is the substance then of the biblical hope? What are the things that we're hoping in? Well, there are over 700 promises in Scripture which speak direct words of hope right into our lives. There are over 700 of them. And we need to, as Peter reminded us, we need to get these words of hope and promise into us so that when we scan the horizon, when giants face us down, we have these words of hope. Here are just a few. Through Christ, our sins are forgiven and we have redemption. I mean, that's a big one, the hope, the freedom of redemption. We've been given a new identity as sons and daughters in God. We have the hope of inheritance. God has a plan and a purpose and a destiny for us. We have hope for a future. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land I am living in. Like we have hope for the steps ahead of us. God is leading and guiding us. And we have hope that he who began a good work in us will carry it on until completion. We have hope that we're getting better, that we're getting more Christ-like. Like, has anyone told you that recently? You are getting more Christ-like because he who began a good work in you will carry it on until completion. We have hope that Jesus is going to come back. Jesus is going to come back. And when he does, he's going to make everything right. Everything that is painful right now, everything that is broken is going to be restored. Every tear will be dried and every sickness will be healed. We have hope in the bodily resurrection and in eternal life. And so in the face of sickness and death, the scripture says, you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Many of you will have seen that Pastor Tim Keller, who, who served as a pastor over in New York City for over 30 years, sharing the gospel of Christ faithfully, really shaping and changing the landscape of preaching in our time. Um, he passed away yesterday and went to be with Jesus. And, uh, and Tim said this right before he passed. He said, I'm thankful for the time God has given me, but I'm ready to see Jesus. I can't wait to see Jesus. Send me home. You do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. We have hope in eternal life. And you see, we've seen that in Tim because he's had this diagnosis for the past three years. And we've seen the way that that eternal hope has affected his day to day and the way that it has anchored and held him every single day of that journey. Not just today when he's finally in the arms of Jesus. We have hope in the bodily resurrection. We are getting new bodies, all the stuff that feels painful and hard right now, every ailment that isn't healed in the present. We have a sure and certain hope of a new body, free from pain in the coming age. Another beautiful story of hope, which is much closer to home this time. Many of you will have met the wonderful Helen and James Sinclair, who are sitting just there. And um, Helen and James have been part of our community for a little while now. They are just the most beautiful and incredible couple. And their lives changed really dramatically last June when James was diagnosed with motor neuron disease. And a lot of you will know that is an incredibly cruel and rapidly advancing condition. And so James and Helen have been on a really challenging journey since then. And he has slowly lost his ability to walk and even to speak and now communicates using his eyes to type messages. 
It's difficult to imagine a more challenging year than the one that they have just had. And yet these two just glisten with this gritty hope in the midst of it. And in February, they recorded a short testimony. I just wanted to share a quick part of that with you now, because here's the thing. The stark reality of motor neuron disease, it doesn't get the final say for this couple, because they have hope in the bodily resurrection. Listen to what they say. This is James. Throughout this, I have been very realistic, and I know that this will result in my early death. But to me, being a Christian has meant I know that I will get a new body in heaven, which is ready and waiting for me, and will make good all of the problems I'm facing as I get worse in my health. And Helen adds this, she says, and that makes a massive difference. The trust in a new body in heaven, and James is hoping a new bike and possibly some new windsurfing kit. <laughs> she says, it just changes everything because we are certain that God is with us in this journey and we are his precious children and that death itself is not to be feared. <laughs> And thank you for letting us hear that incredible, incredible word. And what we see from Tim Keller and what we see from Helen and from James is that whatever the storm you are facing today, there is an anchor that is bigger. There is an anchor that can and will hold you, that is steadfast and secure and powerful to anchor you and give you glistening hope today and for the future. So just as we land, I want to ask you this. What are the giants in the land for you right now? What are the giants in the land? What is making you feel hopeless today? What are the fears in your heart that are keeping you from the promises of God? I wonder if for some of us here, there's a fear, a loss of hope so deep in our hearts that we wouldn't even dare articulate it. But we know that it, somehow it has crept its way in and it is there. What are the places that if you're really honest, you have lost hope? What are the giants in your land right now? And whatever fear is gripping at those deep places in your heart, there is a hope today that is bigger. There is an anchor that is heavier and it can and will hold you in your storm. And so what I want us to do is we just head back into worship. Why don't we stand together? And I want us just to take a, a moment because that was a lot of words and a lot of ground that we covered. But I want us to press in just for a little bit because um, the Bible does say take hold of hope. Right. And, and there's this moment like on the roller coaster where you pull it down, you activate the promise, the faith, you, you take hold of hope. And so I just want to invite you right now where you are, just begin to think where, where is that area in your life that has just begun to take over that place of faith? Or maybe it's a promise that you once held on to, or maybe it's a fear something is not going to get fixed, something is not going to be made right. What is that place where you have lost some hope today? And I want us just to like activate it, just pull down on hope for a minute. In the Bible, in Hosea 2, uh, God promises, He says, I will turn the valley of Achor into a doorway of hope. Accor means trouble. I will turn your place of trouble into a doorway of hope. Where is that place of deepest pain? And what does God want to transform in you right now to refill you with hope? So Holy Spirit, come Lord Jesus. God, we invite you now. We invite you now, King Jesus, to restore broken dreams, to restore lost hopes, to give us a refilling of faith. 
Holy Spirit, we thank you that we do not do this on our own strength. This is not positive thinking. We do not have to master it up. We ask for a filling of the Holy Spirit right now. I pray, especially for those who are really gripped by hopelessness. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would minister to those hearts right now, that Holy Spirit, you would help them to hold on to hope, that you would begin to anchor them, even now, begin to anchor them. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the person of hope that can transform each one of our hearts. We love you, Jesus. And we ask for this in your name. Amen.